So it will be very, very, very difficult for me to parallel uh, what Steve and uh, Tanvir just said. Um, there is just uh, everything that both Steve and Tanvir said is what has energized our interest in um, the Indian dairy market, um, where we learned to think about <clears throat> um, the global balance is uh, what is the demand for edible calories, and then what's the composition of the demand for calories. And that's really how uh, we are wired and how we think about it. And India, hence, is a big interest for us. Um, I, as you know, I grew up in India. I spent half my life in India, half my life here. Well, half of years lived so far. I hope I live longer. Um, so my <laughs> first half of my life was in India. Second half of my life has been here. And one thing I, I say that, and I, don't, I can't statistically back it, but anecdotally, is there are two groups of people Indians and the Caucasians who grew up on dairy uh, as their primary source of proteins growing up. Um, in India, we drank, we drink dairy. Here in the Western world, we eat dairy. Uh, but dairy still is a big component of our nutritional intake. I think uh, that's how we think about it. Anyway, so very exciting. Um, what I'm going to talk about is price. And that's the most controversial subject. Um, and it creates a great social conversation anytime you talk about price. Um, and in price, really, um, broadly speaking, the debate is always between these two things, what the price should be versus what sadly it is. If I'm a seller, I th think the price should be higher, but it isn't. And as a buyer, I think the price should be lower, but it's actually higher than what I think it is. Um, we are presenting this and we'll connect it at the end is, so what is Solara doing um, in helping with this? But um, let's we'll start here. So price, two problems, what it should be versus what it is. So how do we break this down? Now, before <clears throat> we get to the answer, I'll take you through a series of steps of uh, how we look at price from a commodity standpoint. And that then entails us to have a brief discussion on what makes, what is a commodity? And that's important, especially in the fluid milk and the milk market discussion. So what makes a commodity is really, commodity is something that is fungible that can be produced in a form where there is demand. So a simple example is you take crude palm oil, that's a commodity, it can be converted to refined palm oil, it can be refi refined uh, um, oleochemicals, they're all in forms that there is a demand. Um, similarly, you can take packaging, so you can have bulk milk powder, you break it down into small packages, and you now have created a, a commodity in a form that is in demand. And what follows along that is a commodity is something that's fungible, so it meets a quality specification, so irrespective of where it was produced and how it was produced, as long as it meets the quality specifications, it's a commodity, and you can assign a price to it. The second characteristic of a commodity is it can be transported. So it can move from one location to the other, and it can be moved to a location where there is a demand for that commodity. And of course, that assumes that it is economic to transport or cheap to transport. So it's easily transportable. And the third char characteristic of a commodity is it can be stored. So when the commodity is in surplus, it is produced more than it's in demand. So you put it in storage. And then at some point later, when there is a demand, it can be pulled out of storage and deployed at the time when there is demand. Now, the broad assumption underneath there is then, so commodity is one, that it is economic to transport and economic to store. What we're also seeing here is uh, commodity is something that can go through three types of transformation. Form, so it changes its form, crude oil to refined oil, milk to the irreversible change to butter and skim milk powder or cheese and whey. It can be transformed in location, so from one location to the other easily, and it can be transformed in time. Sadly, the time one, we can only do in one direction. We can't go back. So that's the sad part of it, but essentially, um, there are these three dimensions across which a commodity can be transformed, and that's how we think in terms of commodity markets. So each of these elements is associated with a degree of understanding what the price should be versus what it is. Each of these elements contribute to that difference between those two perceptions. 
So <clears throat> on this <clears throat> on this call, um, there are many people in India, and I think India is probably the richest group of marketers I've uh, ever found in a in a um, in a circle. So the marketers will know this better than I ever will. Is what's the difference hence between a commodity and a product or a service? Well, I'll attempt to explain it in the language that I understand, which is the commodity world. Um, so service is something that one is not easily fungible. So it's not, you can't replicate it. And there's a differentiation for which you charge a premium to your customer. Um, in commodity terms, the way I think about that is, so a commodity that is very expensive to transport and very expensive or impossible to store acts like a service or a product. And examples, pretty dramatically different, but similar examples, is raw, raw milk and electricity. Both of those things, well, electricity definitely is perishable. At least commercially, we can't store it today. Um, you can make an argument that you can have N number of big size batteries and you can store electricity. Well, that makes it very expensive to store. Um, similarly, raw milk, <clears throat> perishable, so it can't be stored. And it's, both of these things are very expensive to transport, which <clears throat> creates a market that's extremely localized. Now, compare that to the commodity that we described, which is easy to transport, easy to store, easy to change form. And then you have these two things that are very easy to transport and very, very sorry, very difficult to transport and very difficult to store. So what that does is it creates two different markets. A localized market for fluid milk or electricity, things that perish. And the second part then is a broader market for a commodity that is storable and <clears throat> has a freight market. What that also means is the price of this broader market commodity is one that you can perhaps discover at one place and then add freight and storage costs and get a localized indication. So that's really how we think about you know, this, this dimension of commodities. Within commodities then, um, we break it down further into a second layer, and which is, is the commodity seasonally produced or continuously produced? And is it storable or is it non-storable? And all of those pieces then contribute to our understanding or anybody's understanding of what is price. And that again brings, back us, brings us back to this conundrum of what the price should be versus what the price is. So how do we make this journey based on what we just went through of what it should be versus what it is? Well, <clears throat> um, we go through this process called price discovery. And what I want to explain here is two, three different terms which are used in context of price discovery. <laughs> Fundamental transparency, so the discussion that Steve had and Tanvir had of what is the market, what is the supply, what is the demand, what's the milk production, what's storage, what's the product mix, all of that allow us a level of fundamental transparency. And the fundamental transparency is what allows us to get to what Steve refers to as his milk value or component value. And that tells us what the price should be, what's the content of that price. Then we go through a process of price discovery and the price breadth and quality of information. So there's information asymmetry, which is why the initial buyer and seller's pricing or what they think the price is, is different. If everybody had all the same pieces of information at the exact same point in time, I would argue that difference of opinion between the buyer and the seller would be minimal. So the reason there's a difference of opinion is because there is a you know, difference in the information that's available. Now we add to that, what is the data and other aspects of information that is known? So the first bucket loosely is market transparency. And what the market transparency has amongst many things, uh, market design, number of people in the market, the depth and size of deals they are doing, what are the contracting uh, practices, Market design is, <clears throat> um, is the market an oligopolistic market? Is the market an auction-based market? Is the market a perfect competition, uh, inefficient competition, semi, 
There are many ways of skinning this cat, um, but all of those concepts go into this bucket called market transparency. Then there are other aspects as well of price. So where you have an exchange, a futures exchange or an exchange that you can look at, you actually have a transaction history because you can go back and look at published, printed price history. Um, you also have private and public history of prices. Um, some private ones, you can pay a price to get it. Sometimes you can't. Um, an example is the uh, NDPSR survey here in the States, um, and that's public price history. Um, you could buy uh, pricing for oil commodities from Platts, and that's a, you, I would call that a private price history. Um, there's market depth, there's resilience. What really depth and resilience mean is what is the strength of the market to sustain a price shock? And how quickly does the market recover from a price shock? So is the price shock persistent or is the price shock temporary? And then, of course, value cost, you know, last traded price, efficiency, all the above. And we then broadly put that as a price transparency. Now, what we are doing at Solera is um, we, 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 we attempt to address a small part of this bigger um, problem. And I say problem with a pause is I mean problem mathematically. I don't mean a social problem. So I mean a mathematical problem. And this mathematical problem is addressed as a combination of everybody on this call is as a community that interacts in the marketplace and creates a need for you know, these, uh, these attributes to be addressed. And really, the reason these attributes need to be addressed is to reduce the inefficiency in a negotiation and help a buyer and a seller to get to a price fast, efficiently, with less regret, so they can carry on with their business. And the faster and sooner they carry on with their business and they discover a price, is how businesses get more efficient and you can manage risk around that. So what are we doing about it? Broadly, um, there are a lot of observable markets. The biggest observable markets are uh, the US, the Europe, and Oceania, New Zealand. And by the way, this chart is thanks to Rabobank. Um, it's all on their website, it's pretty cool. You go and we snip it and we put it in this. Um, so uh, from a US price source, uh, there are many sources of price. The ones that are reliable, <clears throat> reliable meaning are available uh, on a regular basis is the USA, USDA's NDPSR survey, um, CME's uh, cash price or cash market, spot market, and the CME dairy futures. European side, <clears throat> the EU has a, uh, a big uh, data reporting initiative called the uh, Milk Market Observatory. <clears throat> we use that a lot. Um, the EEX futures market is still fairly young. Um, there's a lot of support for that in the European market, but still fairly young. Uh, and when I say it's fairly young, is the transacted volumes are not as heavy and as liquid as the CME uh, futures prices, but they're definitely an indication because I believe there's a lot of off-market off transactions or banking transactions that occur referencing that price. And then um, there's in, in New Zealand, we have two prices. We have the GDP auction price, um, and then we have the dairy futures price. Without getting into the details and nuances of each of these prices, essentially there are these three prices um, that you can point on a screen every day. And by the way, they're all available for free. You don't have to pay a penny for it. Um, and these things get published. What you're seeing in the graph, in the, in the chart, is how commodities move. So essentially, these prices reflect also commodity movement. So for example, just think about this for a second, is if U.S. non-fat dry milk lands in Pakistan, so does the U.S. price. So when you get one ton of any of these products from any of these locations to your neighborhood, what you're also getting is that price. And that price is in some shape or form has a local bearance because there's a trade flow that is bringing that product to your neighborhood. And that's helping in this price discovery process. So what we have done is over the years, when we study what Tanvir was pointing to, this calorific imbalance 
and what Steve was talking about is the supply demand balance sheet. We think of that in terms of what price difference needs to exist for commodity to flow from one place to the other. And that's really how we construct our views. So what we do or what we have done is we have taken these three markets and we assign a weightage to it and the weights that we assign. And uh, by the way, all this methodology, these prices will be available on our, on, a web, on, a, on a project that we are doing for free for everybody to use. Uh, so there's no secret here. Um, the weights that we assign is we assign the weights based on a share of exports. Not a share of production, but a share of exports. And the reason we do that is the point that Steve pointed out, which is there is production, there is local consumption, then there is a surplus, and the surplus is then available for export, which is what makes the US, the Europe, and Oceania as origins and makes India, not India necessarily, and this is the discussion we'll have in the Q&A session with Steve is, you know, uh, what, how does India figure in the global balance sheet? But when we think in terms of Southeast Asia, Africa, these are all deficit markets, meaning they don't produce as much as they consume. So that makes those markets destinations. And really, the prices are the ones that connect the origin and the destination. So these price assessments are very relevant to destination markets. So the way we think about that then is we take these weights, assign the weights to commodities coming out from these three markets. And the assessment that we are creating is a butterfrat price assessment and a solid non-fat price assessment. Um, about a year, year and a half ago, I got into a discussion with somebody on this, uh, on this conference. Uh, one of the parts, somebody on this, and the person is smiling, is uh, that there should be a global milk price. And my argument was that, I mean, there could be, it's just not relevant. It's not useful. Why? Because milk is impossible to store and very expensive to move, and hence it's a localized market. You can have an ingredient price that's global and relevant because ingredient is one that can be stored, can be easily transported, can move anywhere, and can change form. And that becomes a very valuable ingredient to that price. So we'll move to the next one. So what are we doing? So what, what that means from an India context is, so think about it this way, is that there's a global butterfat price assessment. There's a global solids non-fat price assessment. So the first step there is to normalize. And we normalize that for currency. Now, interesting part is the, the Europeans publish their price in, uh, in euro. The Americans and the, and the Kiwis do it in US dollar. So we take that, normalize it to a US dollar price. And then we normalize, actually, you in India will normalize that for trade, meaning you know, what is the tariff barrier or the trade barrier. And what you then get is an initial ingredient price indication. To that, we need to add a localizing factor. And the localizing factor is India handling cost, India processing cost. So think about it this way. The drying cost for us here in the States is probably different than the drying cost you will incur in India just because of your cost structures, cost of electricity, cost of infrastructure, things like that. Wholesale packaging cost and a 30-day storage. And at the end of it, what you get is an initial commodity price indication. That initial commodity price indication informs the negotiation. It is not the negotiation. It is not the price. It is, an, it is your first indication. This is our first attempt, attempt to create price transparency. And what we are doing here really is decomposing that price. So when you are negotiating, for illustration purposes, a 220 rupee per kilo skim milk powder price what this will prob probably help you is break that component down and understand that 180 rupees of that is solids non-fat and the other 40 rupees is probably cost. And in the 40 rupees of cost, how much of it is drying, how much of it is handling. And then hopefully what that does is speeds up your negotiation and you realize that you're actually negotiating you know, 10, 12, 15 rupees, not the 220 rupees. And hopefully that is what gets you to the price uh, component fast.
Now, another interesting aspect of being able to look at the global butterfat price assessment and the solids nonfat um, on a, you know, maybe a small history, one or two year historical basis is allows you to see the seasonality of, of, of price. Uh, seasonality of price usually should be opposite to the imbalance. So in other words, if there's more demand than supply, price goes up. If there's more supply than demand, price goes down. So at different points of seasonality, the prices flip, and at least the shape of price should help you with that. So in closing, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, please feel free to reach out when you, if you want to understand or know more details. Uh, we'll be launching um, uh, this website in March, um, hopefully sooner than that. The website is already out. All the methodology is out. Um, I was slightly skeptic of putting a date of January in it, so I put March, but the prices will be available sooner than that. The prices will get updated um, to begin with once uh, once every two weeks, the week of GDT, because that's a huge price discovery uh, event. And what you will get here is the uh, the global assessment for butterfat and, and, and SNF three months forward. And you will also have the ability here to look at those prices in a Indian rupee basis. The stuff that we don't know, which the community here will know, is what are the local costs. So that's something that we have no idea. Uh, you will have an idea. So we'll give you the ability here as a calculator to add your local costs and get an indication of price, and then we hope you use it. So that's all I had. Thank you so much for having me, uh, and uh, up to you. Thank you.